So it's 8 p.m. on the East Coast of the United States, and this is Chip Brogdon at the School of Christ .org, welcoming you to the next message in our series of messages from the book of First Peter. So tonight we are in First Peter, chapter three, resuming the series of teachings that we left off a couple of weeks ago. We took a break for the Thanksgiving holiday here in the United States and in some parts of the world. And uh, so now we resume where we left off in First Peter chapter 3. We'll get started there in just a minute. First, let's go to the Lord as we always do and pray for this study time and also make mention of any prayer needs or concerns that you may have as well. So let's go to the Lord. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together and to be united in one mind in one spirit, in one accord. We proclaim the preeminence of Christ over all things. We align ourselves with your heart and with your mind, with your purpose, your will. And we pray, Lord, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for, for the fulfillment of your purpose and your will in all things that Christ would have the preeminence in all things, that all things would be submitted beneath his feet. And so we glorify you and we praise you that you are working all things together for good, for those who love God, for those who are called according to your purpose. And so your will be done and your purpose be fulfilled, we pray. Meet every need tonight according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus, in whom and through whom we are blessed and have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, as well as daily bread and material things that we have need of. So, Lord, the things, the conditions in our body, the issues with finances, the different things that we might be concerned about, we lift them before you, and we ask, we seek, and we knock for wisdom and understanding and how to best manage the cares of this world. Um, make us good stewards and grateful, thankful recipients of everything that you have given us and everything that you have blessed us with. Uh, we thank you for your word because your word is life, your word is light, your word is truth. And we look to your word for encouragement, for strengthening our inner man, for edifying, and for bringing us to a place of spiritual maturity, that we would be no more children tossed to and fro by every wind and every wave of doctrine, but would grow up into Christ as we desire the sincere milk of the word, that we would grow thereby and would be able to handle strong meat, exercising our senses to discern good and evil with the wisdom that you have given all of your children. So, Lord, thank you, and we bless you and we praise you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you are in agreement with that, say amen. And if you don't mind, type amen into your chat window so that I know that we're communicating. See, I should probably do that when we get started, but the way I figure is I'm talking to the Lord the first five minutes anyway. So now, now it's time to come back and check and see if anyone is actually listening or if anyone can actually hear me. All right, so it looks like we've got... Um, two-way communication, at least you can hear me. So uh, if you're new to the webinar, the way it works is I'll give a presentation. We go through one chapter a week, or at least one chapter at the time. I'll give a presentation, make some points, and uh, at the conclusion of the presentation, I will open it up for your questions, comments, feedback, or whatever you'd like to share pertaining to 
the chapter that we are studying tonight. So hang on to your questions and things until that point. You might find out that your question gets answered in the meantime. Um, but if not, then we're going to give you an opportunity to interact at the conclusion of the presentation. So with that being said, let's jump right into 1 Peter chapter 3. And again, welcome to those of you who joined us after the top of the hour. We are in 1 Peter chapter 3, and uh, we'll be discussing something that is near and dear to the hearts of everyone, I think, because it's going to talk about your favorite subject, ladies, about being submissive to your husbands. <laughs> and I chuckle and I laugh because uh, I can't think of very many other teachings that have been as uh, taken advantage of by men and and misconstrued and misapplied by men and even some women as the whole idea of women or wives submitting to their husbands. So I, I hope tonight we're going to make some progress towards a better understanding of this passage of Scripture. And uh, like everything in the Word of God, you should take things in context and you should judge Scripture with Scripture, and you should have a good working knowledge of the spiritual principles behind individual verses. You shouldn't build a, an entire doctrine or teaching or belief around one or two isolated verses. So when we talk about things like the preeminence of Christ and God's will and God's purpose, we're not basing these principles on one or two or three isolated verses, but we're basing them on a handful of spiritual principles that are supported by a multitude of verses. And that's called rightly dividing the word and hearing the whole counsel of God. But what carnal people do and what fleshly people do, what immature people do, is they see one verse in Scripture like wives submit to your husbands, and especially the husband sees this and then goes back to his wife and hits his wife over the head with this one verse and clearly lacks understanding of the whole counsel of God concerning this, or he would never behave in that manner. So I just want to introduce the topic and allay that fear right from the beginning uh, that we're going to look at this in a balanced way. And, uh, you know, some people may be in agreement with how I teach it. Some people may not. That's okay. You can uh, prayerfully look at it and come to your own conclusion. My goal here, as, as always, is not to dig into the extreme depth of things, but to give you the bullet points, give you the highlights, give you just enough to whet your appetite, and then hopefully uh, cause you to do your own study, search it out for yourself, pray through it, see what the Lord says to you in it. Don't just passively sit back and listen to me or anybody else tell you what the Word of God is all about, but use this time and this teaching as the springboard for your own personal study and your own time with the Lord. That's going to be a whole lot more important to your spiritual growth and maturity than passively listening to me teach for an hour or an hour and a half. And then you close the Bible and you say, well, that was a really good teaching. And you, you go on. There's a lot more than what we can cover in an hour or two hours or even three hours. So the goal is not to, to tell you everything as much as it is to point out some things to give you some little uh, tidbits to, um, to pull back the curtain and give you a little glimpse of some things that you might want to consider. But then hopefully you'll take that and, and go to the Lord and work it out um, in your own private study. So with that in mind, we come to 1 Peter 3, and I think we'll divide it up into five areas tonight. And it's all going to deal with the attitude, the attitude. Attitude is very important. And 
I, I guess probably the best way to get across the importance of attitude is uh, it, it's never in your life, in, in your circumstances and the things that you experience, it's never what happens to you. It's always how you respond to what happens. There's a lot of things you don't have any control over. You can't control the weather. You can't control many of the circumstances that you're going through. You cannot control other people. A lot of our frustration comes from the fact that we're trying to get other people to do things that we want them to do, and they're bound and determined to do what they want to do, and they're not doing what you want to do. It could be your spouse. It could be your employees, if you have employees, or your coworkers. It could be your boss. Um, you know, it could be your neighbors, could be your kids, could be your parents. But you have no control over what other people do. You have no control over the economy. You have no control over world events. One thing you always have control over, no, no matter what you're going through, is your attitude. You can choose how you're going to respond to whatever happens. So that's why attitude is so important. The same thing can happen to two different people, and you see two completely different reactions based upon attitude. It's, it's an amazing fact of human nature that the same exact event, for better or for worse, can happen to thousands of people at the same time, and you'll get a thousand different reactions to that event. Some people get bitter. Some people get better. That's just a fact of life. So you can decide if you're going to be the ones, one of the ones who gets bitter at what happens or if you will get better. But that, re, that decision is completely within your control. You can decide how you are going to let other people other things, other circumstances, control your attitude. So the first step is you've got to take 100% responsibility for your attitude. That's the first step. If, if you're always in a negative attitude that says, it's not my fault, it's everybody else's fault, if only they would do this, if only they would stop doing this, if only my parents had been this way, uh, if only I had had all the advantages that so-and-so had, then things would be different. Well, you might be right. But the point is, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to respond to what you are going through at the moment? What are you going to do? You can get better or you can get bitter. And most people choose to get bitter. They get into a negative attitude, and it just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy at that point. So attitude is important, and I think it's just as important, even more so important in the life of a believer, a follower of Jesus, than anyone else. I can't expect people out in the world to have a good positive attitude, although I am surprised at the number of people who don't know Jesus. They don't claim to be spiritual people, and yet they recognize the power of having a positive attitude. And so, amazingly, they're able to overcome challenges and obstacles. And they don't give God any credit for that. They credit their own ability to have a positive mental attitude. <laughs> then you have Christians, on the other hand, who should be the most positive, have the most positive attitude in the universe. Uh, and yet, many of them are so full of excuses of why things are the way they are and it's not their fault. And they end up having a more negative attitude than people out in the world do. <laughs> well, uh, that should show you that it, there's more to this than meets the eye. Your attitude is important, and it's, it has to do with your mindset. It has to do with, uh, with your point of view. And what I'm trying to communicate is that as a Christian, as a believer in Jesus, your attitude should be on a higher level than anyone else's attitude in the world. I, I, can't, I cannot expect someone in the world who doesn't know Jesus to have a positive attitude. But I do expect people walking with the Lord 
who have the truth, who've been saved, to have a better attitude about life, about themselves, about other people. And um, that's where renewing your mind comes into play because your attitude has a lot to do with your thought processes. All right, so all of this is related to 1 Peter 3 because I think all of the five areas that we will hit on tonight have to do with attitude. Not talking about spirituality, but we're talking about attitude. You're not talking about your heart or your intentions. Everyone has a has a good heart and they have good intentions, but we're not talking about your your spiritual life. We're not talking about your good intentions. We're not talking about I mean well, my heart's in the right place, or their heart's in the right place. We're talking about mental attitude. Your attitude, your your how you treat other people, how you react to other people in your relationships, what's coming across. We're not even talking about what you believe, because what you believe doesn't necessarily line up with how you behave. Belief is one thing, behavior is something else. A lot of people behave in ways that they don't really believe is correct, but that's the only way they know to be. So we're trying to get real practical here with First Peter 3, and, and uh, when it comes to relationships and marriage, I don't think it gets any more practical than that. <laughs> so number one, we'll talk about the ideal attitude of the wife. Secondly, number two, we'll talk about the ideal attitude of the husband. And you say, well, I'm not married, so this doesn't apply to me. Well, it might apply to you at some point, because you never know. Um, you say, well, I'm divorced. It's too late for me. It's never too late for you. And uh, even if you're not in a relationship or you don't plan on being in a relationship, you don't know what the future holds. And even if you have failed in a previous relationship, you can take what you are going to learn tonight and take it together with your experiences, for better or for worse, and you might have some words of wisdom to share with people who come across your path uh, who are having a hard time or who need to get some wisdom about what to expect. So don't think you're disqualified just because you've made mistakes in the past. If anything, that, that helps to qualify you. It gives you valuable experience that you can pass on and um, make what you went through count for something. That, see, now that's another that is another perspective that has to do with attitude. If you have a negative attitude, you'd say, oh, it, I failed in my marriage. I've been married three times, and who am I to, to talk to anybody about marriage? That's the negative attitude. Positive attitude is, hey, I've learned some things. I've made lots of mistakes, and I can help others to not make the same mistakes that I made. So that's putting a positive attitude on an otherwise negative situation. Same situation, but you can handle it two completely different ways. All right? Am I connecting with anyone out there so far tonight? It's okay to type in amen if I'm connecting at all, if any of this is making sense, if any of it resonates with you. So 1 Peter 3, number one, ideal attitude of the wife. Number two, ideal attitude of the husband. Number three, ideal attitude of the family of God. See, because that's what this is all about. This is what we're trying to get around to, is to teach people, look, how you behave in the family of God is a reflection of how you behave in your own family. Paul said it, it's a great mystery, but Christ and the ecclesia is just like a man and a woman being married. He says it's a mystery, but if you can get marriage and get how that's supposed to look, then you can understand something of the relationship between Christ and his body. So if, if you've got a, a distorted attitude towards women, a distorted attitude towards marriage, a dysfunctional family, it's going to be difficult for you to grasp the spiritual lessons 
of Christ and the body of Christ, the ecclesia, because they're connected. And uh, so we'll look at all of those. That leads us into the ideal attitude of the suffering, the ideal attitude of the ones who are suffering for righteousness' sake. So it, it's just taken for granted in Scripture that you're going, if, if, if anyone, Paul says, if anyone, all who choose to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Now, your, your particular kind of suffering, your particular persecution may not be the same as mine or the same as Paul's or anyone in the New Testament, but the point, the fact of the matter is, that you cannot expect, it's unrealistic to expect that following Jesus is just going to be um, just a smooth ride because it's not going to be a smooth ride. Uh, the difference is how we choose to respond to it. So that's, that's the attitude of the suffering. We'll talk about that. And finally, the perfect attitude of Christ. So you, you see what I've done here? Ideal attitude of the wife, ideal attitude of the husband, ideal attitude of the family, ideal attitude of the suffering, and then the perfect attitude of Christ. And so what I want to keep before you at all times is Peter is giving us the ideal attitude that we should have, but how many people live up to this ideal attitude all the time? There's only one person who has the perfect attitude in all things, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he, is, he alone is worthy. That's why he is Lord, and we're just disciples who are following him. He's the master, and we're the servants. He has the perfect, he has the perfect attitude. Meanwhile, we are working towards the ideal attitude that we're supposed to have, but we're not there yet. So it's easy when you read these things to almost feel like you're under condemnation because it seems like it's so difficult to live up to. Well, nobody can live up to it. This is a very idealistic portrait of what your attitude should be. Now, should be and actually is is two different things. Isn't that right? We all know how we should be. But if we see a difference between how we should be and how we actually are in our walk, in our attitude, then it, that's to be expected. It just tells us that we have more growing up to do in that area. The only one who ever had a perfect attitude in every situation towards every person, towards everything, towards every circumstance was the Lord Jesus Christ, is the Lord Jesus Christ. So keep that in mind. As we go into 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct, conduct of their wives. Now, the, the first thing that jumps out at me is the second word of this. Wives, likewise. Well, since we just jumped into chapter 3, and it's been a couple of weeks since we were in chapter 2, you might wonder, or at least I wonder, likewise what? It says likewise means in the same manner. So it's like we're interrupting his train of thought here. We're just jumping into it. Wives likewise be submissive. Well, like what? Likewise what? what? you got to go back. So you go back and you see that it's talking about that uh, Jesus, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Wives likewise... Be submissive to your own husbands. And it, you see the connection. He's saying in the same way that sheep 
are used to going astray and going off by themselves, but now you, like sheep who have gone astray, you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. In the same manner, wives, submit to your own husbands. Be submissive to your own husbands. What's the connection? Well, it's to the sheep's advantage that they return and be submissive to the shepherd because the shepherd is watching over their souls. The shepherd is there to help them, to care for them, to provide for them. So it's kind of dumb for a sheep to say, I'm going to go off by myself and do my own thing. That's what the shepherd is there for, to prevent that from happening and to make sure that the sheep are being taken care of. Do you see a connection here between what the sheep are supposed to be doing, what the Lord does for the sheep, and then what the wives are supposed to be doing, and what the husbands are supposed to be doing? And if it's not clear yet, it will become more, even more clear when we get down to this section about husbands. Uh, most carnal men do not read this far into First Peter 3. They just quote 3.1. Woman be submitted to me, I'm your husband. That's as far as they get. But since we value the, value the whole counsel of God, we're going to not just read that, but go back and get the context and then keep reading forward and get the application. So, wives likewise, like what? Just like the sheep who went astray, but now they return to the shepherd because the shepherd can provide and take care and watch over and protect them in the same way wives. Likewise, be submissive to your own husbands. Now, doesn't say women be submitted to men. It doesn't say man has authority over all, all women everywhere, right? It says wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands. Not to everybody else's husband, not to all men in general. <laughs> But do you see a relationship? I'm trying to get you to see the connection. There's a relationship between the sheep and the shepherd. There's a relationship between the wife and the husband. Both have responsibilities. It's not a one-way responsibility, but both have responsibilities. So wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. So the ideal situation, ladies, is that you are married to a man who loves the Lord. But, Peter says, even if some do not obey the word, it's going to be your conduct, your attitude. Look at that. Your attitude that's going to win them without a word. Now, he's not saying that every all of them are going to be one but that they may be one. If there's any potential there, the potential for them coming to the Lord is not going to be through your preaching to them, but just by being an example. What's another word for when a wife preaches to her husband? Let's, let's make this interactive. You've got the chat window there. So just type in another word that comes to mind. What's the first thing that comes to mind? Another word for a wife preaching to her husband. Thank you. The prize goes to Thea. She says nagging. And that's exactly the word I was thinking of, nagging. <laughs> now, how many men like to be nagged? No man likes to be nagged. So Peter picks up on this. He says, don't nag your husbands. Instead, if they don't obey the word, then win them without a word, just by your good example. And verse 2, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Uh, so, uh, again, you've got to take this scripture and bring it into context. Uh, what's it talking about? Is it talking about that you tip women, that uh, uh, wives, are you supposed to tiptoe around on little mouse feet, afraid of your husband? And, uh, you know, he sits in his recliner and says, woman, bring me a beer. And you go in there, you know, like, Edith's going to get a beer for Archie. <laughs> you bring, the, bring him his beer and plump, plump up the pillow and put it under his head and rub his feet. Is, is that the picture? I, I hope that's not the picture that 
you get of what Peter is talking about here. We should probably go ahead and start going through these points as we read them or it's the point's going to be lost. So number one, the attitude of the wife, be submissive to their own husband. So then secondly, what, what is this word fear? What is that? Fear, uh, to be afraid of. Reverence, you're getting a little bit closer. I think the best way to describe it there, to bring it into the everyday language, is respect. Respect. Um, so there's a lot of words that are, are can be used to describe respect, but it, it's still talking about an attitude. You can respect your husband. You can respect your, wi your wife. You can respect your parents. You can respect your children. You can respect your employer. You can disagree with them all you want to, but you do it with an attitude of respect. So there's a difference between being disrespectful and being respectful. Even a hobo out on the street deserves respect, even if you don't agree with the person or even if they're being obnoxious or whatever. I guess what I'm trying to communicate is that all people, regardless of how you feel about them or how much you think they may or may not be entitled to something, we owe everyone a measure of respect. We should respect our teachers. We should respect our police officers, firefighters. We should respect the doctors and nurses who are trying to help us. We should respect our neighbors. We should respect strangers, meaning simply that we treat them the way we would want to be treated. Or as Jesus says, do unto others as you would want them to do for you. So respect means to be to be courteous. It doesn't mean to be a pushover. It doesn't mean to let everybody have their way. It simply means that you respect. You don't talk down. You're not discourteous. You're not rude. You're mindful of, of them as a human being. So it's very plain to see that when this is lacking in a marriage, you're going to have a problem. If the wife does not respect her husband, you say, well, my husband's not worthy of respect. That's beside the point. Maybe he's not. But every human being still, you are still required to give them some measure of respect. You say, that's difficult. Well, I'm, I'm here to tell you this whole chapter is difficult. If you're looking for easy, you're in the wrong chapter. If you want easy, go to Psalm 23 and just think about the shepherd and, and green pastures and still waters and, and restoring your soul. And, and you can get lost in that. That's easy. But this is practical relationship issues that we struggle with on a daily basis. There's nothing in this about, uh, nothing in here that is easy. Respecting other people is difficult because, why, why is it difficult? Because very often they don't respect you in return. But see, Scripture doesn't make that a condition. It doesn't say love people who love you. It doesn't say respect people who respect you. But this whole thing uh, between a, a wife and a husband having to do with fear, reverence, I just think the best way to to bring that up to date in our language and with our understanding and still be faithful to the spirit in which this was written is to just understand and see the word respect there. All right. Verse 3, do not let your adornment be merely outward arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden 
person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty, beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. All right. So women, ladies, wives, where should your beauty be? Scripture teaches inward beauty is more important than outward beauty. Now, it's not saying, as, as some people would take that to mean, that women are supposed to be plain, no makeup, no jewelry, plain clothes, unattractive, and that's the way women are supposed to be, or covered up, <laughs> as some other religions teach. Well, it's not forbidding the use of these things. It's just saying don't let your adornment be merely outward. Don't just think that your appearance is the most important thing. Now, granted, in our society, in the world that we live in, people put a great emphasis on appearance. But what Peter is trying to get across to us is that the inward is more important than the outward. So um, that, that should be obvious, but I guess, again, people take a verse and they think that it, it's forbidding the use of makeup or forbidding the use of having jewelry. And it's, you know, they're, again, they're getting sidetracked by something that's not important. That's not the issue. The whole issue is the inward beauty. I don't care what you do to the outside. It's the inside that's important. And that's the same thing Jesus told the Pharisees. So again, how does the wife win her husband if the husband is not a Christian? Verse 5, for in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Well, that right there should let you know that the fear he's talking about is not to be terrified of your husband. It's just talking about reverence. What does reverence mean? Well, it doesn't mean worship your husband. It simply means have the proper respect. And respect goes both ways. So, you win your husband not with words, which is nagging, as we've pointed out, but with deeds, with the behavior. Now, why would Peter make a point to tell women that, to tell wives that? Well, because it's, it's just a fact, I think, of human nature that... Women are fixers. Women are more in tune to relationships than men are. And when women see a problem in a relationship, they want to immediately move in and fix it. Uh, but typically the way it comes across, the way the husband interprets it, the way the man interprets it, it comes across not as trying to fix the relationship. It comes across as nagging. So then the husband gets defensive. The man gets all riled up and defensive and angry. So scripture doesn't say you shouldn't be this way. <laughs> it's just saying there's a better approach. Um, win them with acts of kindness, not with nagging. That's how it's going to be interpreted. So, well, I'm not nagging. I'm just telling him what's good for him. <laughs> well, try a different approach. And after a while, he'll start. He'll wonder what's going on. <laughs> All right, so that's the ideal attitude of of the wife. And it, it, I, I say ideal because as soon as you start talking about this, somebody will say, "Oh, brother Chip, you just don't know about my husband." Let me tell you about my husband. I can't submit to him. If I were to submit to my husband, let me tell you what he would have me doing. And they'll give me all these examples of why this can't apply to them. Or somebody will say, well, um, what about husbands that, have, that physically or sexually or emotionally abuse their wives? Are we supposed to submit to them? Well, listen, what, what, what Scripture is teaching 
And what I'm trying to get across is the ideal attitude. I don't think Scripture or any place else, and I don't think Peter intends to tell women that they're supposed to, to stay submitted to someone who is beating them or is being abusive to them. But we've got to set we've got to set somehow a a standard and a portrait of what things should look like. This is what you're working towards. Now, if you're in a situation that is so bad uh, that you are in physical jeopardy, that that's completely different. Now we are not in the ideal situation anymore, and there's little hope that you're going to be in an ideal situation. But what I see time and again is people, they hang on, they hang on, they get beat up and beat up and beat up, and they still they think that they're somehow it's all going to work out because they're trying to do the right thing and be submitted to their husband. Meanwhile, they're getting beat up. Well, that's, uh, that's just foolishness. So use wisdom here. What we're trying to, to get at is the ideal situation. This is what marriage should look like. So it's important to bring the other end of this into it. You've got the attitude of the wife, but the wife is only one half of the marriage. There's another half, men and women, and that is the attitude of the husband. So let's look at that. Verse 7, husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife. Now let me ask you a question, men. If you gave honor to your wife, if you honored your wife, I mean really honored your wife the way she should be honored, do you think you would have to worry about whether or not she was submitting to you? If you really honored your wife, don't you think your wife would automatically, graciously, happily submit and respect you in return? <laughs> so if it's not happening, it's not one person, it's both people that we need to look at. There, so there's a, there is an equal responsibility, it's a shared responsibility here between the wife and the husband. So what's the husband to do? Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Boy, there's a whole lot in that one verse. Uh, now, the, the feminist in the audience will hear this, and they'll get offended because it says that the wife is the weaker vessel. <laughs> I'm not the weaker vessel. And they'll, they'll get riled up at that. A lot of people, a lot of women will. Well, in this situation, it is good to be the weaker vessel. In this situation, being the weaker vessel is an advantage. In the same sense that being the weaker vessel of a sheep compared to a shepherd, it's to the advantage of the sheep that they are the weaker vessel because that means they can trust in the shepherd to watch over and provide for them. Life goes a lot easier when the sheep do what they do and the shepherd does what he does. When the sheep try to be the shepherd, it doesn't work. It also doesn't work when the wife tries to be the spiritual head of the house. Why? Because the wife is not the spiritual head of the house. Who is the spiritual head of the house? Uh, now, now let's, let's just throw that question out there. Because that, that comes up all the time. So answer, and I won't call your name out. I, won't, I will not embarrass you. But I want to take a quick little poll here and type in who is the head of the house. I'll give you three or four seconds to give that some thought and then, then type in what you think. I said, wives, don't try to be the head of the house because you're not the head of the house. And that, that argument is as old as the hills. Well, my husband won't be the spiritual head of the house, so I have to be the spiritual head of the house. 
All right. So who is the spiritual head of the house? If a woman is not supposed to be it, a lot of people would say, well, the man, the man is the spiritual head of the house. Ooh, ooh, he's the spiritual head of the house. Now, if you said that, that's fine. I understand why you might say that. But here's the answer. And this has worked for us, for Carla and I, for 22 years. The wife isn't the spiritual head of the house. The husband isn't the spiritual head of the house. Who's the spiritual head of the house? Christ. So if you want a marriage that works, you need to have Christ as the spiritual head of the family, the spiritual head of the house. Husband's not qualified. Wife is not qualified. The only one who is qualified, remember, we all have the ideal attitude that we are aspiring to, but the only one who can do this perfectly is Christ. So it doesn't say anywhere in Scripture that the husband is the spiritual head of the house. It does say that Christ is the head of the ecclesia. And if he is head of the ecclesia, and the ecclesia is just like a marriage, and the family at home is similar to the family of God, then what you see is that the two shall become one. You say, well, then what is the role of the husband and what is the role of the wife? Well, they have different roles. They have different functions. But it works best if both husband and wife are submitted to Christ as the head of the house. Again, this is the ideal. Most people don't get that. Most marriage problems that I have counseled among Christians have to do with arguing over who's in charge. And in a family, in the family of God, you don't argue over who's in charge because Jesus is in charge. But each one of us have different responsibilities. So a husband has one responsibility and role that he plays. The wife has another. It's not that one is over the other or one is more important or one is less important. Both are equally important. So when you see here where it says give honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, it doesn't mean that the husband is better than the wife. What it means is that as the weaker vessel, the wife is supposed to have greater honor than the husband. Because here's the scriptural principle. The one that is younger is exalted. The one that is weaker is blessed. The one that is last is first. And the older is supposed to serve the younger. See, this is the, the backwards paradox that most people don't get. But if you go all the way back in Genesis, and this is where spiritual principles are established, you see the, the older brother always gets replaced by the younger brother. The younger is exalted. So what am I getting at? It's very simple. As the weaker vessel, a wife is supposed to be honored, protected, cared for, and provided for by the one who is stronger. The older is supposed to look after the weaker, and that's the implication there. So the first attitude, responsibility of the husband is understanding your wife. Dwell with them with understanding. You say, well, what if my wife doesn't do the first part of this? She doesn't submit to me. She doesn't respect me. She doesn't reverence me. Well, that's between her and the Lord then, isn't it? Because it doesn't say anything in here about 
wait until she does what she's supposed to do, and then you do what you're supposed to do. So the very first thing, husbands, that you are responsible for is to dwell with them with understanding. Understanding your wife. Listening. Understanding. And that can be difficult because men are problem solvers. Women are relationship fixers. Men are problem solvers. I did it myself tonight. Carla is telling me something that she's concerned about, something that's bugging her. And instead of just understanding and listening and empathizing, I want to jump in and fix it. Well, what you need to do is X, Y, Z. And that's not what she wants to hear. <laughs> she wants to hear, I understand. Right? So I've been at this for a few years, and I'm still learning as I go. But the number one thing, men, that you can do to honor your wife is to understand her. And by honoring your wife as the weaker vessel, it doesn't diminish her, it exalts her. Because the older, the elder, is responsible for the younger or the weaker. So again, this is just like the shepherd taking care of the sheep. That's a good thing for the sheep. It's a good thing for the wife when the husband understands what it is he's supposed to be doing. But once again, ladies, the husband is not the head of the house. Christ is the head of all things. So if your husband's not cutting it, go to the Lord and talk it over with the Lord. Because, again, no matter how long or how short of a time you've been married, you cannot control what other people do. That includes your spouse. You cannot control what they do. You cannot. So go ahead and let that out of your system right now. You can no more control your spouse than you can control the stranger driving down the street that cuts you off on the highway. You can't control that. You cannot control your spouse. Now, what happens is people believe that they can control their spouse. They are under the illusion that because they are married and because they are living together, that they can control the other person and mold them and shape them into what they think they should be. But you cannot control another human being, even if you are married to them. People have tried. People have failed. You can't do it without being abusive. Now, I'll grant you that. You can control people by being manipulative and abusive and controlling. Yes, you can control, but that, that's, that's not um, uh, that's cheating. That, <laughs> that doesn't make for a happy relationship. So you can't legitimately force anyone or change anyone to do anything. And then some people do it, try the passive-aggressive approach. Well, if you're not going to do what I want you to do, then I'm going to begin withholding something from you. I'm going to withhold respect, or I'm not going to give you the intimate relationship that you want, or I'm not going to give you the, the honor that you want, or I'm not going to give you the respect or the attention, or the time that you want. I'll shut you out until you do things the way I want them to do. And that's just the passive-aggressive approach. But regardless, it's still trying to control somebody else. Just it, uh, Your life, your, your relationships with other people will go a lot more smoothly if you will give up on the idea that you can control other people. It's not up to you to control anybody else. It's a full-time job just getting your own self under control, much less trying to manage other people. So, husbands, understand your wife. Honor your wife as the weaker vessel, the weaker vessel and now you know the context of that. How do, you, how do you honor your wife as the weaker vessel? Well, number one, you serve her. Serve her. See, it's interesting, it, it doesn't say anything about wives serving your husbands. Husbands are to serve their wives. That's how you honor them as the weaker vessel. Serve, watch over. See, again, connecting it to the shepherding of the sheep. 
So the ideal attitude of the husband is someone who honors his wife by serving her, watching over her, and providing for her. Being the provider is a definite, scriptural, godly responsibility of a husband. Doesn't mean the wife can't work, but the primary responsibility of the husband is to be a provider. The wife is to be a nurturer. She nurtures, she cares for. This is just the way that men and women are designed by their creator, and that's why uh, you need a man and a woman to have a marriage. Doesn't work. Any other combination doesn't work. And even a man and a woman in marriage isn't going to work unless Christ has the preeminence in their relationships. Because it's going to be hard, ladies, for you to submit to your husband if you're not first submitted to the Lord Jesus. It's going to be hard for you, husbands, to honor your wife if you're not first and foremost, determined to honor the Lord in your marriage. So Christ has to have the preeminence in all things and including your relationship with your spouse. So again, that's the ideal. I understand many people's situations are not the ideal. But again, we're talking about your attitude. You cannot control the attitude of your spouse. You can control your own attitude. That's the lesson here. But when it works, and when you're both submitted to the Lord, and you're both submitted to one another, Scripture says to remember that you are both heirs together of the grace of life. That puts you on the same level. So by saying the wife is the weaker vessel, it's not diminishing the wife, it's not exalting the husband. Because it, in the very same breath, he says you are both heirs together. It just simply means the husband has one responsibility to his wife, and the wife has a different set of responsibilities to her husband. And they're not supposed to be the same. They're supposed to be complementary. They complement one another. You say, which is better, your left hand or your right hand? Well, I want both hands. You might favor one or, or be more used to using one than the other, but the point is both of your hands are valuable, and you don't want to be without one or the other. You need both working together. So that's what Peter says. Remember that you are heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. All right? Well, that leads into the third section of the attitude of God's family. Because all of this is a lesson. All of this is an object lesson to teach us how to love one another. Verse 8, finally, all of you, now see this, now we're encompassing all of God's family. All of you, regardless of your marital situation, or your relationships, you are part of a great family of God. So all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. All right, let's break that down a little bit. The, the last couple of sections are going to go a lot faster but I, because I had to really lay a, a good foundation for husbands and wives here. But you see, it's leading to a bigger picture. It's not just about your marriage. It's about your relationship 
to the body of Christ, and it's about how, your attitude towards other people in general. So the attitude of God's family, first of all, it says that we should be of one mind. Now, what does that mean, to be of one mind? Well, it doesn't mean that we all think the same way. We all believe the same way. We all have the same opinions. No, we all have different beliefs, different understandings, different viewpoints, different philosophies, different approaches. That's not important. What's important is that we all have the same mind. And what does that mean? Well, it means the same goal, the same purpose, the same aim. Paul said this one thing I do, forgetting the things that are behind, I press on towards the mark for the goal of the high call of God in Christ. And we know that God's goal and, and his purpose is that Christ would have the preeminence in all things. So if we all have that one mind, that Christ would have the preeminence, that Christ would be increased, that he would be glorified, that he would be exalted, then it bonds us and binds us together into one mind. And really that word mind there is just another word for attitude. Have the same attitude, same goal, same purpose, same aim. You might look at it differently. You might go about it differently, and we all do. We all have different opinions. We all have different approaches. We all have different backgrounds, different understandings. But if we can all have the same goal and the same purpose, I really don't care about all the other stuff. If we are all looking to grow spiritually, towards a Christ-centered maturity and faith. It's got to be Christ-centered. It can't just be a lot of nebulous something else. It has to be in alignment with the ultimate purpose and plan and will of God, which is that Christ would have the preeminence in all things. So with that one mind, Jesus, that Jesus would be Lord of all, then we can function together as God's family, and we can value the differences that we have without feeling like everybody has to say it, believe it, act upon it exactly the way we do. So in a family, what do you have? You have different people, different personalities, different skills, different gifts, but they're all members of the same family, so that's the same attitude that we should have of God's family. Compassionate, which just means empathetic, being able to empathize. You can relate to other people. You can identify with other people. It means you can understand what they're going through because you've been through it yourself. So you've, you've, got a, you've got a lot more tolerance. You've got a lot more patience. You've got a lot more compassion, a lot more sympathy and empathy for other people. That's the right attitude. The wrong attitude is to be judgmental and critical of other people. So again, we're talking about the ideal attitude here. Loving one another, being tender-hearted. What's the opposite of tender-hearted? It's hard-hearted. And Jesus says in the last days, because the love of many will grow cold, men's hearts failing them for fear, people will become hard-hearted through lack of love. So to stay tender-hearted, we have to stay in love with God and in love with one another. Courteous, that's another good attitude that we need to have. Basic, common, courtesy. It simply means respect. We're, talking, we're back around to respect again. You don't have to agree with everything I say. I don't have to agree with everything you say. But we owe it to one another as members of the same family to be respectful and courteous of one another. Boy, if we just remember our manners and just be courteous, wouldn't a lot of the conflicts and the disagreements never start to begin with? But most of us are, are and you know, I'm including myself, we're so defensive, we're so sure that we're right, we can't take the least bit of criticism without 
losing our temper or thinking that we have to rise up and defend and justify and critique and throw it back and uh, we're just following the way of the world when we do that. So as members of God's family, uh, we owe one another a measure of courtesy and respect. You know, that, that's pretty straightforward. It's pretty uh, self-explanatory, I think. And it's really easy to see who's got it and who doesn't. If, if, you, if it's not happening in your life, it's very easy. Just, just ask the people around you, and they'll tell you. <laughs> well, it's all about your attitude. Blessing one another and not cursing. Now, you think that this would be self-evident as well. But it's important enough to be mentioned. We should bless one another and not curse. Build up and not tear down. Encourage and not discourage. Look for things that we agree with instead of being like the trial attorney that's looking for the one part per million that he doesn't agree with and then building a whole case around that one little microscopic thing that he disagrees with. You know, it's, and, and it's human nature. That's the way human nature is. That's the way the world is. You very rarely hear, per, percentage-wise, you don't hear a lot of good, you don't hear from a lot of good, happy, satisfied customers. Even though you can do, as a business, you can do a great job and you can satisfy 99% of your customers, most of them you won't hear from. If they get what they expected and they're happy with it, you might get a few people that, that actually respond and, and say that they appreciate it and give you a testimonial or something. But I guarantee you, if you drop the ball with that 1% and you don't deliver or you don't perform or you don't give them the result, they are all over you. <laughs> so I'm just saying that that is human nature. So when we as Christians behave in that manner, it just shows that we are carnal and not spiritual. It just shows that we are behaving just like the world, focusing on the negative, focusing on what we disagree with, picking a fight over the 1% thing that we're not satisfied with, excluding, shutting out people because they're only 98% what I think they should be, and that last 2% we just can't get past, and so we, we throw out the whole thing or get rid of the whole person so it's an attitude problem it's the way of the world it shouldn't be the way of God's family so let's look for things that we can agree on let's look for a blessing I'm not saying let's start an ecumenical movement and <laughs> just throw everybody together and uh, force everybody to all behave and act the same way remember it, we're we're not saying that we agree on everything and that we are uh, uh, thinking the same and teaching the same and believing the same and behaving the same as everyone else. But we look for what we can agree on, and that's what we choose to emphasize. Let the world emphasize the negative and the bad news. As Christians, as ambassadors of light, let's see if we can find areas of agreement at least with one another, <laughs> at least with members of the family. All right, so that brings us to the attitude of those who are suffering. As all of these situations, all of these relationships, it's just practice. It's just getting you prepared for how to be submitted to the Lord in the midst of your suffering. Submit to your spouse. Submit to one another in the family of God. Submitting to the Lord in the midst of your suffering. 
That's difficult. I told you there's nothing in this chapter that's easy. If you're looking for easy, go to Psalm 23. First Peter 3 is not easy. But it's real and it's practical. So verse 13 says, Who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? In other words, do the right thing and you're going to get along with more people. I mean, what you sow is what you reap. If you do the right thing, treat people with respect, treat them with courtesy, even if you don't agree, be respectful, be courteous. Don't do it with words, but do it with deeds. Most of, the, most of your problems are going to be cleared up, but not all of your problems. Who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense or an answer, would be a better word to use there. So trying to get away from the idea that you have to defend something, that you have to be defensive. That's not the sense of the original here. But it simply means to be prepared and be ready to answer, to give an answer to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, not with arrogance, but with meekness and fear. Again, with respect. See, fear, reverence, respect. That's the progression of that word there. With meekness and fear. It doesn't mean you're trembling and you're shaking and you're afraid to tell anybody that you're a believer in Jesus. That's not what the word fear means here. It's talking about reverence and respect appreciation and understanding of the earth, of the other person but also being equally passionate and understanding of the truth of what you believe and why you believe and that's the why is so important they're they're not asking you what you believe they're asking you what is the reason for the hope why do you believe what you believe you know, so a lot of people get really hung up on what we believe. Here's my statement of faith. Here's what I believe. Here's what we stand for. What do you believe? And the world's not interested in that. They want to know why. Why do you believe that? And most people can't answer why. But for those with spiritual maturity, what progresses into why and why turns into who? It's not what I believe, it's who I believe. I know him whom I have believed. So for us, our why is a person. So that's, he is our reason for the hope that we have. Verse 16, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, falsely, I'm, I, that's the understanding here, when they falsely defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Now that's hard to take. That's hard to take. You know, if I suffer because of my own stupidity, it's a little bit easier. It's still not easy, but it's a little bit, I can be almost resigned to the fact that well, you know, I'm kind of reaping what I sowed. I made some wrong decisions, made some bad choices. Now I've got to, to pay for those and work my way out of the situation that I created. But it's a different thing when you do all the right things and you still suffer unjustly. There's nothing that, that, that goes against our sense of justice and righteousness and fairness as to suffer and be penalized and be persecuted when you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. You're doing the right thing. And yet, you still suffer for it. Well, that seems to be the path of those who are most spiritual. Happened to Joseph, happened to Job, happened to Daniel, happened to Jesus, happened to Paul, 
I mean, you're in good company here. No one is singling you out. Nothing is singling you out saying that we're just really going to pile up, pile on you. But Peter says, if, if it's the will of God for you to suffer for doing good, that's better than suffering for doing evil. So what's the implication? Accept it. Resign yourself to it. It's not easy. In fact, I would say it's impossible. You're going to have to tap into the life of someone else, a larger life than what you possess, someone who is larger than you, who can absorb it, who can handle it, who can overcome it, because you can't, and neither can I. So what's the attitude of the suffering? What does it look like? Well, I think this is really some practical advice if you're going through difficult circumstances, as we all are in, in whatever area. Take your pick, finances, relationships, something in your body. Well, as soon as we start experiencing some suffering, experiencing some discomfort, the first thing we want to do, it seems, is open our mouth, wag our tongue, and what usually happens is we end up inserting our foot into our mouth. We put our foot in our mouth. We say things we wish we hadn't have said. So the first thing you do is you ask God to help you control your tongue control your mouth your mouth gets you into all kinds of problems so remember everything that I'm just rehashing what Peter has said he who would love life and see good days let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit all right so the second attitude of suffering is do good verse 11 says let him turn away from evil and do good keep doing good even if you're being persecuted for it do the right thing. That's the lesson. The third aspect of this attitude of the suffering is seek peace. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Paul says, as much as possible, as much as lies within you, seek peace and live in peace with everybody. Again, that's the ideal. There's going to be some people, some relationships, some circumstances, that even though you seek peace with all your heart, you're not going to find it with that person. And then it's going to be time for you to move on. But your attitude is one of a peacemaker, one who seeks the peace and pursues the peace and tries to live in peace with everybody. You're not stirring up trouble. You're not making a problem for people and all you have to do is be disrespectful and be discourteous of other people even people who don't know you disrespect them and don't be courteous to them and look at all the strife that you're going to stir up for people you don't even know just because of your bad attitude now when you're suffering it's hard to keep that perspective so this is just uh, things to, to bear in mind here, the attitude of the suffering. Here's how you surrender and overcome in the midst of it. Control your tongue. Watch your mouth. Do good. Keep doing good. Be faithful. Seek the peace and pursue it. Pray. Yes, pray. Don't stop praying. Keep on praying. For the eyes of the Lord, verse 12, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. So you pray. So you, you take number one, which is control your tongue, and turn it around to, to number four, which is to pray. Take whatever complaints. Don't complain to other people, because other people don't want to hear it. And they've got enough to deal with on their own. Take your complaints and go to God. That's what David did. He didn't complain to other people. He, he complained. He says, I poured out my complaint to the Lord. Complain to God all you want. That's prayer. <laughs> Just don't complain to everybody else. 
It doesn't do them any good. It doesn't do you any good. But a strange thing happens when you begin to complain to the Lord. You turn your complaints into prayers. And it's, it's interesting, the things that begin to happen. It's Not only is it very therapeutic, but in the process, you begin to get some answers to, this, to some things. I know this from experience. And then prepare. What is this? Verse 15, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you. Be prepared. The Lord is, is bringing you, he's allowing circumstances and difficulties and, and suffering to come your way for a purpose and for a reason. Don't waste that opportunity. Pray and prepare and learn the lesson. Learn the lesson of the season that you are in at the moment, because this too will pass. And when it does, you're going to have a testimony. But listen, you can't have a testimony unless you have a test. So first you go through the test, and then you have the testimony. It's a hefty price to, to pay, but it's really the only way. So that brings us to the attitude of Christ, because everything we've talked about up to now is how we ought to be, but yet so many times we come up short, don't we? So we see the ideal, but the only one we can look at as the perfect example, it's not Peter. It's not the one who's teaching these things to us. It's certainly not me. The only one that we can look to as the example is Christ. So we look to the attitude of Christ as the example of how we are to live and walk in him. And what's interesting about these last few verses here in First Peter is that it gives us the overview of the attitude of Christ from the cross to the throne. And I, I like that teaching. It's a teaching that's on our website. You can listen to it for free, listen to the MP3, or you can get it on Compact Disc. Just go to the website, theschoolofchrist.org, and uh, click on the on the teachings tab or the mp3 library the compact disc library or just go to the search box and type in from the cross to the throne and you're going to find this teaching on the website but it, it basically takes you from the crucifixion death burial resurrection ascension and seating of christ from the cross to the throne it's a neat thing to study and i, I like talking about it But the point for our consideration tonight as we close, beginning in verse 18, is the attitude of Jesus through all of this. So you say, well, it's not fair that I do all the right things, and yet I still suffer for doing all the right things. It's not fair, and it's not just. Well, look at this, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Now, if you ever want an example of what's not fair, what's not right, what's not just, here's the greatest example I could possibly give you. It's not what you're going through or what I'm going through that we think is not fair. What's not fair is that Jesus, the perfect one, was crucified for the imperfect. The just died for the unjust. Where's the fairness in that? It's absolutely unfair. But look at all the blessing and all that was accomplished because God allowed that unfair, unjust event to occur. The just died for the unjust. Paul says, for a good man, some might be willing to die, but God's great love is demonstrated in this, that Christ died 
not when we were his friends, but when we were sinners. When we were enemies of God, it says, God reconciled us to himself through Christ. The just died for the unjust. The Holy One died for we who were sinners. Is life fair? Probably not. But in the end, we see that God is working out a purpose that goes beyond fairness, that goes beyond justice, and we see that this purpose is working towards a higher good and a higher goal and a higher purpose that will, in the end, eventually result in something far better than mere fairness. It's not fair that Jesus died for sins he didn't commit. And it's probably not fair that you're suffering the things that you're suffering. But what we see from Scripture is that there is a purpose that transcends fairness. It's the full measure of blessing. It's the full measure of the wisdom and purpose and counsel of God. To take what was meant for evil and to bring it around and work it for good. As Joseph told his brothers, you meant this for evil, but God intended it for good. And we know that God works all things together. The good, the bad, the ugly, the fair and the unfair, according to his purpose. So by looking at the example of Christ, remember we learned in our last session from 1 Peter 2, to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Well, here's the example. He suffered having done no wrong. You and I certainly cannot claim sinless perfection. So why do we expect a life free from suffering when the only sinless one who ever lived suffered the greatest possible suffering that anyone could suffer? So, the just died for the unjust, baptized into his death, verse 19, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, but not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. He's talking about being baptized into Christ, not being baptized into water. It's not the washing of the body. It's the cleansing and washing of the heart through the blood of Jesus. This is accomplished, verse 21, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we've got his death, his resurrection, and then verse 22, who has gone into heaven, and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. So there's the, the circle is complete from the cross to the throne. And the point of this is to show us that Christ submitted to the will of God in his suffering, and as a result, because he humbled himself, God has highly exalted him. It says in Philippians 2. And has given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So that's where submission gets you. It might not get you very far in this world, but it gets you very far in the world and in the age to come. And then we'll pick up next week in chapter 4. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. 
It's linking us together with the Lord Jesus and with his attitude. So that'll be a good place to pick up in next week. Some quick takeaways for you. Takeaway number one, God still uses people with bad attitudes. Because 1 Peter 3 is so idealistic, people say, you know, I'll never be able to submit to my husband. I'll never be able to love my wife the way I'm supposed to. I've got all these issues. I've got all these problems. And you know what? That's all right. God still uses people with bad attitudes. He's not waiting for you to have the perfect attitude, to have the ideal attitude before he can use you. Jonah had a bad attitude, and God used him. Jonah 4.3 says, Therefore now, O Lord, take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Because I prophesied all these things were going to happen, and you're so compassionate, and you're so loving, and you're so forgiving, and you forgave all those sinners of their sins, and now I look like an idiot. So I'd rather just die than, and I didn't want to even come to Nineveh to start with. I wanted to go in a different direction. I knew this was what was going to happen, and just take my life from me. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of preaching, I'm sick of prophesying, and just kill me and get it over with. What a bad attitude. <laughs> what a rotten, stinking, nasty attitude. But you know what? God didn't strike him dead. He didn't take his life. He taught him a lesson. And I think, actually, Jonah probably learned that lesson, and, and he went on from there, even though it doesn't record that. So God still uses people with bad attitudes. Just recognize that your attitude is your responsibility. Go to the Lord and say, hey, Lord, I've got this bad attitude, and I need your help. And, you know, make it, keep it simple, and he'll begin to work with you in that area. But you've got to recognize it and take ownership of it. Take responsibility for your attitude. And if it's not the right attitude, get a new one. You can do it. Remember, takeaway number two, Peter wasn't perfect either. So we'll look at Peter's telling me all this stuff, wives submit, husbands honor and love, and it, it just all sounds real idealistic. Yep, and that's exactly right. Just keep in mind, Peter wasn't perfect either. Galatians 2.11 Paul said, but when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face for what he did was very wrong. So Peter's not telling you this because he's arrived. He's not telling you this because he's got it all worked out himself. But it's the truth. It's the principle. It's the ideal. And we are all working towards that ideal. We're learning. We're growing, making mistakes and falling, just like Peter. Peter understands this better than any of us. He's the one who denied the Lord three times. Remember? So Peter wasn't perfect either. So don't use that as an excuse to excuse yourself and say, well, I'll never be able to measure up, so what's the use? Or try to water down First Peter 3 and say it's just too idealistic. God remembers that we are only dust. We're not perfect, but we're working, we're growing. We are aspiring to be, to follow in the footsteps and in the example of Christ. That's the point. And we've got to have something to see what this looks like. All right, so takeaway number three, and this is good. Here's the ultimate attitude adjuster. Not I, but Christ. So on the one hand, I'm saying you've got responsibility for your attitude. You decide how you're going to choose, how you're going to respond to the things that happen to you. Your response to what happens is far more important than what actually happens. At the same time, I'll tell you that there are just too many things in this world that are beyond your ability, beyond your control. And so the ultimate attitude adjuster is to realize Galatians 2.20, which is actually the secret of the Christian life. It's not I, but Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So we see the ideal, and we see how far we fall short of the mark, and yet we see in Christ the perfect attitude. He was perfectly 
perfect in his attitude towards God, perfect in his attitude towards other people, perfect in his attitude towards his suffering. And this same Jesus lives in us. We share in his life. And if we could just learn this secret, it's not I, but Christ. Then we can experience his perfect attitude coming in, overshadowing our imperfect attitude and conforming us and changing us and transforming us by the power of the Holy Spirit from the inside out.